delighted to welcome Sharon Mackay to the Mount to talk to us about um, what we've called walking and drawing the line about issues of violence in children's literature and to venture into the area of a graphic novel because, of course, her latest book, of which we have nine advanced copies hot off the press, right there. Uh, only nine, because that's all we could get from the publisher in time for today, but they are available to you for the price of $19. And oh, for God's <laughs> <laughs> If you want to see the graphic novel, War Brothers. Brothers. <laughs> Sorry. Um, of course, Sharon has a number of titles uh, for which she has won, <coughs> been nominated, and she has won a number of, of awards. Uh, in the probably best known are uh, Charlie Wilcox and Charlie Wilcox's Great War. Uh, but she has also been nominated for uh, significant prizes uh, for Thunder Over Kandahar. And uh, I'm impressed. This is great. Keep going. <laughs> You're what? chewing up time really nicely, and I just keep going. I think that's my hint to no, stop. No, no, it's, it's not. It's, please keep going. What's really important, to, uh, and what intrigues me about Sharon's work, besides the quality of the things that I've read, is that she is the first children's writer, writer for young adults, to be appointed uh, under the Canada Canadian Forces Artists Program. So she's a war artist. Um, and under this aegis, she has gone to um, the Gaza Strip to Afghanistan to um, 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 Uganda. Uganda, thank you very much. And next month she goes to Mali. So she's... They canceled me. Oh, did they? They're sending me back to Kabul. I go back to Kabul. Okay, there you go. <laughs> we, we'll stop doing this back and forth. Um, it's my honor <laughs> and, and pleasure to introduce Sharon to you. She is going to talk for a while. She said, if you look all terribly bored, she's going to stop and start telling blonde jokes instead. <laughs> um, so don't look bored, because I have this thing about blonde jokes. I used to be a blonde. Um, and I'm going to try and run the PowerPoint. I, I said to her confidently there's nothing really interesting um, <laughs> that I would do this for her, but she doesn't know about my technological ability or lack thereof. So we could, you could have a good laugh this evening. Sharon, thank you for coming. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, one of the things about, first of all, uh, you can talk all the way through this. I would prefer if, you, if, if a question comes up that you're not sitting there waiting to the end and, and you just, just yell it out. I mean, look, there's, there's just us, okay? So just tell me, how many are the graphic novel people? Get out. <laughs> okay, thanks. A couple? All right, good. Get out. Um, I am a newbie in this field, so be kind, please. Um, I am going to start with being what a war artist is. And the reason I'm starting there is because it is such an amazing program. It is a Canadian program. It belongs to us. Um, it is not British. The British have a program, but they took it from us. There are programs all around the world. There was one in Australia. Uh, it's gone now. Uh, America, gone now. Um, so a war artist, really briefly, and this is where I get stuck, because I love it so much that I just talk about that and forget about the rest of the stuff. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, it started in World War I. It, uh, we think of World War I ending in 1918. It did not. For many soldiers, um, that were brought back from the front to England, they couldn't get away home. There were no ships to take them home. Many Canadian soldiers simply languished in England. Uh, they were hated by the English because they did turn out to be thieves. They were broke, they were poor, they were hungry, um, and they did what they could to survive. And in this group, there were painters. There were also a four of the group of seven sort of hanging out, um, and a guy named Lord Beaverbrook. This is really the short version. This is the version where, you know, an academic gets curly crazy. Make it short. Um, who saw these drawings and commissioned a few of them to be turned into paintings. This is where the War Artist Program started. And why it was so incredibly important 
and remains important today was that before this, the only thing that we knew about World War I was dispatches from the front, number one. We had these little journalists, little blobs that came through that were very controlled because a lot of the journalists couldn't get to the front, so they just wrote their news from, you know, back in Kelly. So when people were told that their sons died uh, heroically, that they weren't in pain, that uh, they, they died surrounded by their friends, Canadians believed it. Um, the photographs we have from World War I, look at them again. And you will see that they were all done in the spring or the summer. There was no mud. Um, they were all done on a sunny day because the cameras could not manage foul weather, obviously. So it was only with these paintings did people see how their sons died. Over the entire time that the War Artist Program has existed, World War I came back in World War II, Alex Coville was, was a war artist, um, it came back in Bosnia, it was around in Korea, it uh, was even in Vietnam, although Canada, of course, was not officially in Vietnam. Because Canadians were down there, they actually sent war artists to uh, document their work. Um, so this work now exists. Uh, it exists mostly in the War Museum. It, um, it had a huge impact then, but of all this work, and I've seen a lot of it, there is not one single painting or drawing or now photograph or piece of art that is pro-war. Not one. That's amazing. It's, it's Canadian. It's us. And I'm not saying that it's ne necessarily negative. Alex Coville focused, for example, on uh, nurses and on the backstory to war. So it's not all negative. But there's nothing that's positive. That is so amazing. And you can apply. OK. We're done with that, Sharon? All right. Um, I am a fact-based fact writer. I know that because someone called me that, and I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, you know, you, you're, like, you, read, you, read, you read like things about yourself, and you go, really? Well, one of them was, was this, and I thought, I, that's kind of cool. That's, that's kind of cool, so I'm, I'm using that. I have written um, about 30 books. Um, in terms of the fact-based fiction, there's Thunder Over Kandahar that was written uh, primarily in Afghanistan. Where's the other ones? Enemy Territory um, was written partly in the West Bank, um, where I found myself an apartment and the world's worst case of diarrhea. <laughs> Never mind that. <laughs> War Brothers, uh, this is, uh, I don't have the real book. Um, I could only find the uncorrect <laughs> proofs. I, I, I tend to go places and give them away, and I realized I didn't have one. Um, so I actually, in order to write this material, oh, I'll tell you my favorite book. This is my favorite. Chalk around the block. If I go to heaven, and they say, what you do, I'm going to say I did this. I invented, I did, sidewalk talk, this kind. Yep. I walked into Jane Somerville's office 100 years ago and with three pieces of chalk in, in an elastic band and said, can we make chalk this big? And we think, it's been around forever. No, it hasn't been. Yeah, I didn't copyright it. Yeah, I'm still poor. Okay. Um, so over the course, um, of, of, I would say, 25 years of writing. I would say that I have talked to maybe half a million children. Um, I have talked to them about political material. I have told them jokes. I have tried to get them to read. I would basically stand on my head to get them to try any book at any point. And I could say, here's the questions. 
Here's the questions that I get most frequently. Flip the page too soon. Deep questions, thoughtful questions. Is your hair real? <laughs> that question came in China when I was in China. And they couldn't believe that anybody would actually, ha this was in Shangdong province before the province had opened up. And I said, this is to a whole amphitheater, and I said, yeah, you want to touch it? <laughs> and I walked up and down the aisle. <laughs> that was interesting. Um, question number two. I'm my family's from Ireland. I go to Ireland a lot. Um, are those your real teeth? <laughs> from Saskatoon. Do you write your own books or does someone else write them for you? <laughs> And the big one, the big one. Where do your ideas come from? This is the one that every single writer from the beginning of time has been asked. Now, I simply say that I keep them on a jar in my desk, on my desk, because I've given up trying to explain magic. There is no mystery to writing. You put your bum in the chair and you don't get up. There's no mystery to that. The magic happens when you're actually writing. Um, and magic happens in this case when your characters are built so well and so strongly that they take over and they just run the show. If you're surprised reading a book, surprised at something that the character does or the story does, it's because the writer was surprised. Charlie Wilcox was supposed to be a book about, um, this is about World War I, about the Battle of Beaumont Hamill, required reading in Newfoundland. There's a lot of Newfoundland kids that hate my guts. Um, this was supposed to be a book about sealing. I was actually going to write the first book about sealing. My husband's only comment was, we're changing our address. Um, I had Charlie on a, uh, and this is, we're going to talk about violence sooner or later. Um, I had Charlie on the docks and he was going to stow away on a ship. As I'm writing this, I am, well, he's on the docks, right? Okay, what's going to be on the docks? Well, there's going to be ropes. There's going to be fishing stuff. Oh, wait a minute, it's 1916. There's right, there's going to be soldiers. What do they wear? What do they look like? Okay, well, they're brown. Ooh, okay, they wear brown. He stows away on the ship, comes up. He looks out, and I'm writing away, minding my own business. And he looks out, and this, the sea is blue. And I'm reading this, going, that's weird. It's not blue. It's, he's going to the ice. He's going to go hit a seal, maybe a baby one. And he looks around, and there's no ice. That's really weird. And he looks back, and there's soldiers. I am typing it, but reading it. That's how it happened. That sounds insane, but that's exactly how it happened. And that's how he ends up going to war. Charlie stowed away on the, the wrong ship. There was two types of ships in the St. John's Harbor in 1916, steel wall ships and wooden wall ships. He just stowed away on the wrong ship, but I didn't know it. So you don't believe me, fine. <laughs> um, so I write about conflict. I write outside of my culture. Thunder is a book about Muslims. Um, this one, this is, I consider this one my only failure, enemy territory. Um, this is just, just out and I'm not happy at all with it. Um, this is about Palestinians and Israelis. I'm thrilled with some parts of it. Some, it, it starts to rock. Sadly, you have to hit about page 80 and kids don't stick around to page 80. Um, too many cooks in this one. But this is about Jews. Sorry, I don't use Jews. Israelis and Palestinians. Um, I go there. I always go there. I write from the source. So if I'm going to write about child soldiers, if I'm actually going to tackle this, 
I will go there and I will do it. Um, I will not write from photographs. I will not, I will write from interviews. I interview everybody. Uh, guy, hey, look, black guy in the street. You from a Uganda? Sorry. Okay. Um, I have a crew of editors and publisher, my publisher is brilliant. It's uh, Rick Wilkes from Anik Press. Um, I also work with Penguin. I, p I choose my editors. It's part of my contract. Um, you get me, you get my, cr my crowd. And um, I haven't been nailed yet. It's coming. I have no doubt that it will come. Um, I write action. And in action, there is, oh, we're finally getting to it, Sharon. There's violence. I, I actually draw my own line and then walk it. Except I don't necessarily know where this line is going to go. Um, can we flip? Sure. This is me in a tank. This is a good picture because I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> okay, so three minutes later, it was just chaos. Make that go. All right. <laughs> this is a question that I think we need to talk about. This is a question that came from a teacher uh, this week. Hello, Sharon. I've read a couple of your books and love how you broaden students' small worlds with current international issues. I <laughs> teach grade 7 English in Barrie, Barrie, Ontario. Very white bread, very, very uh, middle class. Um, and am contemplating studying War Brothers in a couple of weeks. What is the target audience? In your experience, are 12 year olds too young for this theme? I'm concerned, here's the biggie for, for any teachers. I'm concerned that parents will find some parts desensitizing. Any thoughts? So let's leave that in your mind as, as a teacher's, and, and this is what teachers are dealing with all the time. Remember, 12 year olds. Okay, so that's, let's move on. So our theme for tonight is why do we have our knickers in a knot about violence in children's lit now? Why now? Um, why not 10 years ago? Something's happened now. Um, and part, we, we all, we can go back. We can go back in history. We, we know that Grimm's fairy tales, we could do this for two hours of the history of violence in children's lit. Um, we don't have two hours. Um, but what I will do is move us up in history a bit and say that something happened to us all in 1984. And George had nothing to do with it. Um, in 1984, Brian Stewart was the first North American reporter to focus the world's attention on the Ethiopian famine. Now, I'm 60. Oh, here's where you're supposed to go. <gasps> really? Um, so I remember this. I remember the moment when suddenly it was real. Those children were real. Because all before that, it was eat your peas, there's children starving in China. But now we can see them. This, this to anybody under, under 40 might be amazing. But to us, we were glued to the TV. We couldn't believe it. Brian Stewart took us. He was the first reporter to actually take us to the site. And, and yes, we know that in those days the film would have to be shipped. But we were seeing things that were just photographed 12 hours ago. That was unheard of. We were mesmerized, and so was the whole world. Not only did we demand um, on-ground reporting from that day on, but we developed a thirst for it. We have a thirst for it. <coughs> we want to see it as it's happening. And we have put a lot of, of journalists in danger, some of whom I know very well and know their lives. 
their awful lives. Um, we're over-involved. In World War I, a letter could take months to reach the front. In Afghanistan, and I was, I was in Kandahar province, I was out in, uh, in the field, I was in Taliban territory, I thought that they would be afraid that, you know, a children's writer might get shot and it would be pet, bad PR. At least that's what my husband thought. And, and I wasn't. They put me on foot patrols. Um, I, was, I was all over the place and what I saw was, in part, soldiers, one soldier with a head cam. His wife was watching. Every soldier I saw had a, had a cell phone and a camera. So not only are we getting on-the-spot recording, wives and families are following their husbands, it's male, into battle. That's amazing. Horrifying, <laughs> but amazing. Um, so that was the first thing that changed all of us. You know, we talk about the impact on children. It's, it's changed us. The impact's on us. Then the next thing, and this is no surprise, of course, the next big change was the Internet. And it's lovely to blame all the world's problems on the Internet. It's really easy. Um, but it's a game changer. Uh, violence and sex are at children's fingertips. There are some awful statistics about sexual dysfunction in young boys who need copious amounts of pornography to do what their counterparts did 30 years ago with a Playboy. Not only that, but these boys and girls, let's not be too, oh, I'm sexist all over the place, um, they are demanding that their girlfriends behave like the girls that they see on, on the internet, or in this case, it could be on TV, on specialty channels. This dysfunction will follow them into adulthood. And this, this sexual dysfunction is, is intertwined with the amount of violence. Um, now, before we go too far into that, violence for most children who have not experienced, who have not themselves been abused. Oh, so you're late. I went to the wrong <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Vicki Grant, children's writer. Just thought I'd point you out. <laughs> Turn the camera, get a shot of her. Um, so it's not the amount of violence a child sees. It's really how a child responds. In most cases, violence is theoretical unless they themselves, I'm finishing the sentence, uh, are in fact abused, in which case it is not theoretical. It's very real to them. So, um, if a child reacts positively uh, to the violence, it remains neutral until they themselves attempt to recreate it. Um, it's not real because it can't physically hurt them. Now, take that thought that violence isn't real to most children. And let me tell you about something that happened at Kandahar, at Camp Mirage. Um, you remember Camp Mirage was the jumping off, the staging area for uh, Afghanistan. Gone now, thanks to our idiot politicians, but we won't go there. I was standing in the air base. Um, waiting for something, I don't know. And a pancake landed. And, and this soldier comes up behind me and says, you know what that is? I don't know, pancake. And it, was, it wasn't big. And it was, it was shaped like a pancake, but punched up in the middle. And he says, that's a drone. Cool. Um, now, we're told that Canadians do not have armed drones. I have no reason to say that that's not true. Um, so this, this is a cheerful little fellow. Really cute. Looks like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to pop out any minute. And this guy says to me, um, you know who's controlling this? Mm, there's a control tower. Nope. Try again. 
I don't know, who's controlling it? He said, a bunch of 18-year-olds in Winnipeg. The American drones are controlled by 18 to 24-year-olds in the Midwest. Now, the American drones are armed. They actually can come down. They, uh, those drones can look you right in the eye. Those kids, and of course you know why they're 18, right? Why they choose. Th these are soldiers, 18 to 24 soldiers. Why are they chosen? Yeah. Video games. They're the ones that can make them work. So we say violence is not theoretic, is, is not, it's only in theory. Not to them. Those 18-year-olds are killing people. But it's still on a screen. They've grown up with this. So it's still probably in their heads not real. Not yet. Because we know that they will be 40 one day. We know that they will revisit this. They just don't know. The people who are putting them in charge of this know. But they don't know. Um, <coughs> So I asked a question, I wasn't sure of the answer. <laughs> I love that. As a sub-question, we can also ask, is there a different response to violence in fiction from children whose family or cultural background includes the witnessing of violence? Okay. In my experience, only if they're connected to it. So let's go to War Brothers. I told you this is the wrong book, right? The, the other one's great. Okay, so War Brothers, um, well, fall to Ontario, Ontario. I'll tell you a little bit about Ontario. Um, if you know Ontario at all, you, there's a science centre, and around the science centre, it's a very uh, mixed area. I can go into classrooms in that area. There, typically, when I go into a classroom, there are three classes in one. That's usually, so I'm usually talking to 90 to 120 children at, at the same time. I go into these classrooms and I am A, the only white person in the room, including the teachers. So I'm the only white person probably in the school, in these areas. When I'm talking about child soldiers, chances are that these children in these rooms have had experience somehow. So they may have been child soldiers themselves. They may have been hurt by child soldiers. Their older brothers may have been child soldiers. There is a relationship there. Violence is not at all a theory. It's very real to them. Um, and they will connect with this. And that's, that's incredibly important. That's a good thing. Um, for children who don't have experience, we're going up to Barry here, they are having the opportunity to understand what a whole continent is dealing with. But they're allowed to experience it at arm's length, hopefully guided by a teacher who's as sensitive as this person is, who's as thoughtful and who's going very slowly. And in my experience, uh, her name's Marion. She'll be emailing me every second day. That's okay. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to ignore it. Um, so I was going to, uh, not yet. Okay. In War Brothers, so what happens with violence as, as I write it? Let me make sure you understand exactly how bad this can be. You want to go to the end? <laughs> oh, Archie. Okay, I love this, all right? Archie Comics. I love Archie Comics. Who doesn't like Archie? I mean, you have to like Archie. Okay, flip it. Go, baby. Archie's got a gun. No. No, Archie now shoots. Just to tell you, you know, you think something's safe? Archie's not even safe. Archie's got a gun. Keep going. Bang! I'm going to walk you through this one section of the book. And some of you, I guarantee, will have nightmares tonight. So, I am in a classroom 
Mm, I am probably, well, this was particular. This was in the Country Day School in uh, near Barrie, Ontario. Very wealthy, wealthy school. Uh, it's $35,000 a year. Um, a lot of the kids drove up in Porsches, uh, you know, and I'm driving a broken down Honda, looking at this, you really? It's a Porsche? Jeez. Um, and I go into this amphitheater of beautiful girls, beautiful. Um, and I say to them, and you can always tell, and teachers can do this too, you can always tell the friends, okay? They can all be together, but you can say those three are friends. Those two are best friends. Though you can tell, even if they're, you just can't. And I, would, I said to this, these three girls, who were kind of giggly and beautiful and whatever, and I'd say, I said to them, OK, do you think if I took the three of you out of this room that within 10 minutes I could get you two to kill her? And they look at me with absolute horror. And of course, the answer is never, never. And I said, but this happens to children in Africa, particularly Uganda, um, and in the, the Congo. This happens to them frequently. And what you see is them and us, OK? They're different. I'm a better person. All right, let's see if you are. So. I will take them through. I didn't have these sequences then. So here are the boys. The story, which was a novel, took me two years, um, is about, this is a true story, based on a true story. Um, uh, boys who were in a, a private school in Uganda, and I visited the school, um, who were stolen out of the school, forced marched into the woods, into the bush, sorry, and through this muck, we can go one more, to a, a, a nearby village. Now, what they do with the children is they, they circle so that the children become very disorientated very quickly. They are very frightened. They are being hurt and yelled at. And now they stop. And this is, this is the typical way that it is done. Um, so stop and stay together. Next one, please. Here comes, um, now in the book, this book, um, I have actually have Coney in this book. Dan LaFrance, and I'll talk about Dan in, the, in a minute because he's certainly my hero. Um, Dan LaFrance did not want Coney in his book, his book. Um, and I, he said, fix it for me. He says, I cannot give this man publicity. Okay. How about we use his first lieutenant? So this is the first lieutenant. This guy is actually a real guy. He's dead now. So that's why we used him. Um, gets no publicity. So he says, now there's the boys. Um, very challenging to, to do black kids um, and have them very different so that you recognize them throughout. So you'll notice that one has a number 10 shirt. One has, it's Catholic, Uganda's Catholic. One has a cross at his neck. Um, he says, line up like soldiers. You are rebels now. You fight for freedom. You fight for the Lord's resistance army and for God. Coney is our leader and we do as he says. I shall tell you the rules and you will listen. Next. Only soldiers eat. If you want to eat, you will first fight with us. It is your choice. If you die of hunger, it is your choice. If you steal food, you will be killed. These are exact quotes. I did interview the, uh, one of Coney's lieutenants in Uganda with chickens running around. You must not touch alcohol or any drugs. Uh, we'll get back to that. And all Christians, we must obey the Ten Commandments. Now I ask, do you like women? Okay, who knows what the answer to that is, right? It's frightening. Um, you see these women, okay, flip, <coughs> out comes Hannah. Now, this is what would happen to a girl who had somehow disobeyed. This is where I pulled back. In fact, in Coney's, so stop holding that, in Coney's army, um, the girl would have had her lips taken off, her ears and her nose, often to her eyelids if the plan was to, to kill her. 
if the plan was to make an example of her, then it would be something like just the ears or the nose. I didn't take off her nose, I couldn't. So here we see Hannah. We meet Hannah for the first time. A boy falls down. Next, please. What's wrong with Adam? A soldier hit him earlier. Do not touch him. You touch him and you suffer his fate. This guy's name is Lizard. You, you, you. Okay, go back to my three girls at this very posh school. You, you, you. So I'm talking to those girls now. Next, pick up a log. Kill or be killed. And this is Tony. See, he has a cross. And Tony is adorable. He's a kind, gentle boy. And you've got to know him already, and you like him. I am a Catholic. God said thou shalt not kill. He's taken away. Let me go, let me go. No, no, please, no. And this is what happens. Next. Would you prefer long sleeve or short sleeve? So short sleeve is here, long sleeve is here. Take off your hand or take off your arm. You choose. So he's praying, our Father who art in heaven. Your friend will die no matter what you do. So it doesn't matter. You, you can lose, girls, you can lose your arms and you will die. But he's still going to die. Or she's still going to die. No matter what you do, she's still going to die. Understand that. But if you lose your arms, not only are you going to die too, but you're going to die badly, slowly, and in agony. Okay, next. You start. Okay, we can leave it there. So now the girls are looking at me horrified, and I'm going to say, I want you to choose between, I want you to tell me what you would do if you were them. Dead silent. In fact, the whole room is horrified. And if I do it right, with a lot of passion, and bring in the gentleness, and soften up on them, the, all of a sudden, it's not them and us. I am white, I am middle class, I am different, I would never behave that way. These are Africans, they, no. Now, we're together, okay? Because we would all do the same thing. And just to make sure they know that I understand, if someone gave me the choice between saving my son, especially when he was a baby, and knocking off an entire village far away. I gotta tell you, the village is going. Because that's how it works. So it's not me or you, it's us all together. So I'm trying to make the violence um, real. The problem is not violence being um, Real, the problem is violence being gratuitous. That's where we run into massive problems. Um, real violence is important. To not include real violence is to do disservice to these children. What we need is age appropriate. Um, Huge problem with, I'm trying, I've got to go faster. <laughs> look at this, like, oh my God, look. Okay, I'm going to skip that part. That's a Grimm's fairy tale part. We're not going to do this. We're going to say, countless studies show us that gratuitous violence desensitizes all of us. This isn't about children. That's just what the title is tonight. This is all of us. I now watch, uh, I don't watch any violence. Ever, ever. I was forced to watch, oh, what was that movie we were talking about last night with the witch who melts at the end? Oz. What's it called? Hated that movie. The Witch Melts. I, my mother made me watch it because it was her favorite movie. I was, I have not watched a scary movie in my life. I will not read scary books. If I know that, that there's a, a, going to, a child is going to die in a book and I have to read it, if I'm a judge 
or um, for whatever have to reason. Uh, I'll read the end first to make sure that maybe the kid doesn't actually die. The kid does die, I won't read it. I can now watch Game of Thrones. Five years ago, I couldn't have done that. There's no way I could have done that. So I'm getting desensitized. Some of us are, we, Susan and I were talking, and Susan said last night, no, she's going the opposite way. She can't stand it anymore. She just want violence that way. I'm going the other way. I'm getting hardened to it. Um, so gratuitous violence, here's a definition. If it's not necessary, it's gratuitous. That's it. How hard is that? Very simple. Countless studies show that gratuitous violence desensitizes us all. It's, it's filler. Okay, think Hollywood. It's there to ramp up, and here's the big word for the night, because this is all we need. It's there to ramp up action. So the word action, if, if you think of what do, and I'm going to do the boys thing again. Uh, you have to be a young adult, a young adult writer, to understand that there is a big difference between boys and girls writing. Um, I don't think boys want violence. I don't think that that is what they're after. I think what they're after is action. They want stuff to move along. They want stuff to happen. They don't want to hear about green valleys and flowers or unicorns. They just want some action. Now, to make sure that we're just not talking about little boys, here's this. My husband is reading uh, Lyndon McIntyre's The Bishop's Man. Okay, he started that the other day. And I asked him if he liked it. He said, I'm going to give you a quote. I'm on page 66. I wish the action would start. <laughs> Seriously? By the way, that's my brother-in-law over there. So, and that's his brother we're talking about. You can say later, your brother's an idiot. Um, there is an assumption that without violence, we would somehow lose the boy audience. I don't believe that. Um, I would say the action we would lose the boy audience. Um, and I, I'm going to give some ages here. Um, a boy audience in my head is going from anywhere from 10 to about 25. I have a 23-year-old son. They're still young. Um, violence in books aimed at boys is something we presume they want, but where's the evidence? Can anecdotal evidence be trusted when there is such social pressure on boys, especially, to want it, to be told you want it, to be aggressive? Are we creating in otherwise sensitive boys an expectation that they should want this? Do boys respond positively to violent books because they find the violence attractive or because the books are offering to them something, some significant uh, amount of, of action, of, of ramped up excitement, and therefore it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Boys get excited, it's violence, they like it. Oh look, boys like violence. Okay, pull it out and put in action. See if you get the same response. We can replace the violence. We can do violent material and still stay uh, loyal to, to the circumstance. So let's think of World War I um, and we can think of the trenches in World War I. Battle of Beaumont Hamill, it's Charlie. Charlie finds himself at the front. Battle of ba Beaumont Hamill is arguably the worst battle in the entire war because it was so short. There was other battles that were bigger, that more people died, but this one happened within 24 hours. Uh, a, a loss of 30,000 lives. I mean, think of that today. Um, so, how can I, how can any of us, talk about this battle without exaggerating 
or you don't have to exaggerate actually, you just have to show it. How can we somehow protect the reader but still be loyal to those men who died? Where do you find that? You find that first of all in the character. Um, typically in a boy's book, the arch is the character's challenge that, that comes, that he has to somehow surmount. But this is what it's like to be in a trench. Think of being in a cereal box. Brown in front, brown in back. You can see this guy, and you can see this guy. Trenches are wiggly, so you can't see too far down on either side. I love it when people say, I know I was there. Yeah, really? You think so? You can see blue up there, but that's all you can see. So I can put Charlie in that trench, and I can have all of the explosions and all of the deaths. It can still happen, but because I'm going to stick to his point of view, the reader doesn't have to see it either. So I can give all the emotion, and I can make it internal. I can have him sitting there as if he's in a rain barrel, as if it's coming down on him, the sounds, but I don't have to touch the gore. And I don't have to touch the sights. I don't have to do heads flying around or hands over there sticking out of the earth or something ridiculous. Something that becomes or could become almost comical. Um, the other way is there's a couple of ways. Robert, um, Ronald Dowell, Char Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, he says he undercuts his violence with humor. You can have as disgusting an ending as you want, he says, so long as there is a whopping great laugh at the end. Okay. So let's try that. You can also try shock. 46. So I'm going to describe a little bit and then just read the ending. So you've met Jacob. Um, they are now in their school. Uh, the school has just started. It's, if you notice what Dan has done, the coloring. See the white? You can rest. See the black? Get scared. So here we're in the white part. The boys are at their school. Um, Uganda, as I said, is Catholic. A lot of the kids I met spoke Italian. Uh, French, English, Italian, Acholi, Langi, and we have trouble with two languages here. <laughs> ridiculous. Okay, so they are now at the private school. Private schools are not over there like ours. There they still have to feed their chickens, they raise their own food, they bring their own mattresses to school, and I have been in this school. It's great. Um, and so they're all sitting around talking about what they did basically on their summer vacation. And, uh, okay, where am I going to start? The prefect flicked off the overhead light and the humming generator outside the barred windows was instantly silenced. The lock on the door clicked. The boys were locked in to prevent them from running off in the night to the girls' convent school a few kilometers down the road, a.k.a. boys are boys. Jacob lay in the dark, hands behind his head, and thought he couldn't be happier. Once old Bella said that happiness made her, that cooking made her happy because it allowed her to share her happiness. It was true. A person could be content alone, maybe even at peace, but happiness was only real if they shared it. Someone farted. Put it back! Put it back! Farts can't be caught! The whole dorm roared with laughter all over again. Gee, the prefix were even great this year. It took a while for everyone to settle back down. Paul, Jacob whispered across the space between their two beds, what was it like to fly across the ocean? I was scared, very scared, but I did not want to embarrass myself, so I did what my father did. What is food like in America? Tony leaned out of his bed. Very bad. It tastes like dust and comes in packages. Jacob wasn't surprised. People from America, Canada, and even England sent food to Africa that tasted terrible. He thought that maybe they only sent food they refused to eat, but maybe their food really was terrible. <laughs> maybe they didn't know how to cook. But many people in America are very fat, said Jacob. He'd seen pictures of people. He wasn't being mean. He admired fat. If their food tastes so bad, why are they so big? Well, they eat a great deal of bad food, 
and there's much available in a place called Super. Paul's voice faded, faded for a moment. Super. And I think that when they are full, they keep eating. Do they all eat twice a day? More than that, maybe three, four, five times a day, they call it snack. What is snack? I don't know. Nobody spoke for a moment. Do they all smell sweet? Despite his amazement, Tony couldn't stop his questions. Even black people in America smell white. Jacob was listening intently. He flopped back on his mattress, staring at the ceiling, and tried to picture sweet-smelling fat people. Telephones attached to walls, wires hanging into their pockets. The full moon was shining through the barred windows, and it cast stripy lines on his bed. Smiling, Jacob drifted off to sleep. It was two in the morning when the entire dorm awoke to gunshots. And now, of course, it begins. So just, just to go over this so I don't leave you completely in the dark, um, I know you all know what snack is. <laughs> so even black people in America smell white. Now here's where you get this really you know, obnoxious little kid in the first row. He says, you're a racist. Really? Throw that word around a lot? Yeah, do you? Okay. Let's explain it. Then I'm coming back for you. Um, I told you that I go there. I interview. I talk. And one of the, the people that I, I dealt with, and, and I always have heroes for books, and these are guys who, usually men, who read every word over and over and over and check. And this, this is a guy called Tom, who was brought up in Uganda and who <laughs> comes to Canada and six months later gets into Osgoode Law School. Okay, don't for a minute think they're not really smart. Oh my gosh, six months. And um, so Tom, and Tom kind of looks like he's kind of round. He's kind of like hugs, lovely. And we were in Starbucks and I said, okay, we were talking about you know, some details and this and what boys wore and this, this and the other thing. I said, Tom, a long time ago when I was in China, I remember this girl said to me, I'd, I'd asked her something about, I thought I had perfume on, and I said something like, do you like it? And she says, oh, well, all white people smell like milk. I didn't see that one coming. And of course, that's understandable. We eat a lot of cheese and et cetera, et cetera. But I left that one alone, so let's move ahead. We're back to Tom at Starbucks. And that always stuck in my head, and I said, Tom, do you remember the first person, white person you met? And he says, oh, yeah. He says, they used to come with Werther's uh, candies, because they were wrapped, and you know, you could give out candies. And he says, we, we looked for, you know, the white trucks with white people, because maybe they'd have Werther's candies. And he said, they came onto my father's property, as you can imagine, Tom was quite wealthy. And he said, um, I said, so tell me what else, what did they smell like? And, he, and I'm thinking, you know, they're sweaty, maybe, they, you know. He says, they smelled sweet. Sweet! Okay, this is Starbucks. So the question, the, the people around us now have stopped talking. And you can see actually people going, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> White people smell sweet? Shh, says Tom. Shh. With my white friend here, who's an idiot, <laughs> and I said, "But why sweet?" And of course, to Tom, as a little boy, and we're talking to be about six. Um, think of it. Think of the the creams we wear, the shampoo, and the you know all of this stuff. And and so, to him, to Tom, he said, "When I, I, he said it, it, it was overwhelming. He said they would open <coughs> up the car door, and it was like this, this like being gassed." <laughs> and I said, now all of Starbucks, no one's talking. <laughs> Everybody's listening to this. And, and so that's where that came from. And I love that even, even black people in, in North America, to them, smell white. Because if you're here, you go home, you're going home with all, you know, the head and shoulders or your entire bathroom. <laughs> and um, they're smelling sweet. So I... I put that in because I just don't want you going home with the wrong <laughs> idea. Okay, let's go back to violence. Oh, what the heck, why not? <laughs> the point of reading that to you is how to cut violence. 
how to take something this vicious and find in the books somewhere in the story plateaus. In this book, and I won't read it to you, I did mark it so you're, uh, you're lucky because I could read that to you. Um, in this book, I have two girls running through the mountains, mountains that I walk through. So I knew them quite well. I knew the stones under the foot. I know what they look like. And, and they are being chased. It's horrible. They are scared. They're frightened. And how I find plateaus for readers in this book is one girl had spent time in England, very common in Afghanistan for uh, people to come back. They came back uh, in, uh, in um, 2002, 2003 in droves to try and restart their countries. They, they were professors, they were doctors, they were lawyers. A lot of them came back with their children who had been educated in North America. Uh, Yasmin is one of those children. They are now walking and Yasmin, to help her friend Tamana, tells her about Babar the elephant. And so as they walk with all of this scary stuff around them, the reader is actually getting to a place where the reader can rest. And that's why it's in there. So that children can take a breath. As you see with the whites, it's places to actually, and your brain wouldn't see it. If I didn't point it out to you, I mean, except for the comic book people here. Um, if I didn't actually point it out to you, these are actually visual cues to rest. Um, so the ways to actually go in to, to create, to, to be realistic, to be real, we can, if you're a thoughtful uh, creator or writer, um, you can actually plot it out so that you're not hammering the kids because this is hammering them and they have to have a break. Um, so those are some of the ways that I have managed to um, create uh, difficult stories and still keep my readers. My problem, of okay, here's a question, and uh, you know what? I'm just going to give a one-word answer because, you know, I'm just going to. Does omitting violence in children's literature make for higher quality stories? Okay, one word answer, no. No, it doesn't. Um, it's untruthful. Don't do it. If you're not up to the task, don't do it. There's plenty of other things to write about. I would love to be able to write a story about Phoebe, my poodle. It's just not happening. It's not coming to me. Um, so what is the message of books that do depict war or war violence. I'm going to give you a quote from my writing partner, one of them. I love partners. It's fun. Somebody to talk to. Um, Kathy Kaser. Kathy writes only on the Holocaust. She is, her, in fact, herself um, a child of Holocaust survivors. And um, she and I have written three Holocaust books. That's one of them. Um, and she says this, because I emailed her and said, you know, I have to say something. What am I going to say? There is always value in going back to some of the roots of violence and having young people understand the events. In teaching kids about war, I always want them to understand that there were those, however few, who did not follow the crowd, who stood apart and demonstrated good moral character. Kids can begin to ask themselves, what would I do differently? What do I want to do in this world as a creator? What can I demonstrate as my own moral courage? She goes on, then she gets really pompous. I love her dearly. <laughs> um, violence can go right to the soul of a reader and it can create great empathy. Do it wrong and you're really screwed up. Um, I told you about those three girls. That was a way, and I stayed in contact. When I go to schools, I will often stay in contact with those, those kids for a very long time. Every child in every school that I visit is invited to email me at least once. 
I do not want a relationship with them. They don't want a pen pal with their grandma. But I will respond to them. I, I talk with their teachers. We talk about issues that have come up. I don't just go into a school and leave it and then walk away. Um, and I will often hear um, what the end results are, how this, how this act, did it work? So I want to give you, now I've given you examples of how it can work. I want to give you an example of how it cannot work. And then I've got to wrap it up. I know it's 10 past 3, because if I don't get to class these things, I'm going to kill. So one example of how it cannot work. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. It was a novel written by Boyd, 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 what's his name? Boyne. It was it? Boyne. Boyne. John Boyne. Okay. To date, the novel has sold more than 5 million copies. In 2007, 2008, it was the best selling book in Spain. It's reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list and in the UK, Ireland, and Australia. Here's a quick, 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 quick synopsis of the book. Bruno is a boy who is the son of a commander of Auschwitz. Bruno is very young. He doesn't think it's Auschwitz. He calls it Outwitch. He calls Hitler the Fuhrer, Mr. Fury. So you get an idea of his age. In propaganda in his household, so, so they actually, the commandant lives in a house outside of Auschwitz. This is so improbable, it's ridiculous. Um, and he is told not to go in the backyard. Well, you tell a boy not to do something and you <laughs> could give me a brick. So he, of course, he sees a movie in his house and in the movie it says that in the backyard over there, there are cafes and there's, there's movie theaters and it's really cool over there. So he goes to the fence. Okay. And he looks through the fence and he sees a boy his own age and they make friends. Interestingly enough, the Jewish child on the other side is as ugly as a bag of hammers. They couldn't have found an uglier kid. Um, that, in the movie, that always annoyed me. And this, this kid is a very good looking young German boy. And they become friends and they chat. Oh yeah, that's gonna happen. And one day, moving along, the German boy crawls under the fence. And the German boy is caught up in a roundup and he ends up being exterminated along with as however many are exterminated that particular day. I'm also a graduate of Yad Vashem in Israel um, and this, uh, the Holocaust and I, like my head's exploding with this stuff and I read something like this and it's just, no, no, this is bad. But let me tell you how bad. So this story, which is all over the world, which is taught in classrooms, which teacher thinks are wonderful and whatever, in, in Toronto, teacher read the story and the, child, the teacher, nice teacher, um, well-meaning, uh, said, well, you know, what do you think of that? And the response was, well, the wrong boy died. Think of that. The wrong boy died. So I ask readers to walk a mile in a child soldier's shoes. Child soldiers can be vicious. They are vicious. In Uganda, less so than most because they are not on drugs. They don't drink. In, in other countries, the kids are jacked up so badly that they're actually not even retrievable. Because when they're put on drugs, in, in their drugs, there's often gunpowder, which actually um, destroys the mind. <laughs> um, these children can be saved. But I ask children to become a child soldier. Um, also at Anik is a book called Bite of a Mango. It's a story, it's a true story, the, the woman lives uh, in Scarborough who had both of her arms cut off by child soldiers. The book was, it's huge, it's Bite of a Mango, I recommend it. Um, so there we have on one side to read a story about a girl who had been abused by child soldiers and then in the same publishing house we have a story about um, 
being a child soldier. When you do this, you do this with your heart in your hands. You do this with a ton of research, ton of backing, ton of people, all the right people. Because you get it wrong and you end up with the wrong boy died. Graphic novels. Oh, well, finally, for <laughs> God's <laughs> sakes. Um, I'm actually skipping a whole whack here. Um, how does violence within the graphic novel differ from the traditional narrative? Well, take a look. I, I couldn't, I, every word is my, these are all my words. When Dan would email me and I would have to print out pages, I would have to cover the pages with white paper to write the bubbles. Um, the visual, when you turn something like this, th there are kids who will never ever be able to read this. They just won't do it. But this is accessible to anybody, to any age. We talked about violence as being age appropriate. If it's age appropriate, we're there. It's going to be okay. If it's age appropriate, it's not gratuitous, it's okay with me. But now, a six-year-old can get to this. There's positive stuff coming. Um, this is one of my favorite all-time graphic novels, The Pride of Baghdad. I love this book. I love this book. This is a picture of a giraffe whose head just got blown up. That's your book. He's reading for tonight. <laughs> um, this is the, the pride is the lions. And this is the story, is it Iran? Is it Iran? Iraq. Iraq or Iran? Uh, when the Americans went in and bombed Iraq, <laughs> um, one of the things, places they bombed was the zoo. The animals got out, and this is the story of the animals. Now, this book, I have a six-year-old grandson, love of our lives, and he came to PEI last summer, and this book was on the coffee table. And Kai runs out of the car, yay, yay, he's going to go see his new room, and because it's, you know, you got your own room, and oh, yeah, he bashes into the house, he's gone. And I, we're getting the luggage out, and I said to David, um, Where's that book, Pride of Baghdad? He says, it's on the coffee table. I said, I've got to put that away. Get in there. There's no book. It's, it's, there's no book. And we looked and we looked. And I said, you know what? Because I don't lock doors. There you're welcome to come anytime. I've never locked a door in my life. And um, I said, well, you know, Adrian must have come. I told him to, to borrow it. He must have come in and just taken it. I don't know. Can't find it. Kai had been in that house between us taking luggage out of a car, walking across the lawn, going up three steps and into a house. He had found it, understood that it was a bad thing, that I wouldn't like him to see it, and hidden it in his bed. <laughs> that took under, what, two minutes, three minutes? Tops. This is what I want a six-year-old? His mother would kill me. We'd never get this kid again. <coughs> and luckily, you know, we put him to bed, pulled back the sheet. There it is. Kai, I've got some Archie comics, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let me tell you what is amazing to me about graphic novels. Amazing. Well, first of all, a Memorial University, by the way, has the most fabulous course on graphic novels. I want them to go online with it because I need to take it. So, originally with, class, with comics and the people who already know this, so just stick your fingers in your ears for a minute. Um, comics were horror stories. The 1950s, oh, we had globs coming out of water, we had hulks, we had all sorts of things. And just to make sure, because the parents were all jumping up and down, say, let's get rid of these things, this is awful. Our children are going, their, their morals are going to be warped. It's terrible. Get rid of comic books altogether. Along comes, oh, bless us, the classic comic. 
Albert Cantor. The series began in 1941 and finished its run in 1971. 12 cents a copy. I lived on them. Every Saturday, I went down to St. Bruno, you remember, and um, beside the restaurant, I got my 12 cent, um, boy, I'm old, 12 cent comic book. I got my 5 cent Coke in a glass bottle. <laughs> and I got bubblegum. And I lived on classic comics. Um, that saved, in many respects, at that time, the comic book was just going down deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, it was kind of like up there with, uh, you remember what happened to Mr. Swivelhits, El Elvis, Elvis Presley. It was the same thing was happening here. Um, I was going to talk about the difference between a comic book and a graphic novel, but I'm too scared now. Um, I want to give you a quote from a teacher, I'll come back to that maybe if I have time, about the graphic novel. It's being heralded by a growing number of teacher librarians as turning non-readers into readers. That's amazing. And there are a couple of reasons. One, it's accessible to learning disabled children. Two, it's more accessible to English-speaking children in the classroom. Uh, sorry, non-English speaking children. So, um, and, and th this is an issue because you cannot hand a child who's just popped in from the Sudan um, a book. But you can hand, hand them a comic book or a graphic novel because that's how we did it. If you go back, we were reading Archie or, um, what was the one before, Richie Rich? Um, you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. And you, you kind of get the words and you look at the picture. You kind of get the words and you look at the picture. Kind of, and then you start, and then it clicks. It starts to click. It starts to click. Teachers are using graphic novels in the same way. And it's working. It's amazing. Teacher librarians are saying that they can move a child from a graphic novel to the novel. Did you like that? Does that interest you? Here's the actual book. They will do it. Not all of them, but they're seeing a huge movement towards it. Or if there's not that relationship by a real book and a graphic novel, here's another topic. Here's another book on the same topic. It's working. Here's a quote from a teacher. Integrating graphic novels into my curriculum has been one of the best choices I have made as a teacher. I have seen students with no previous expressed interest in language and literature excel the, in the analysis of a graphic novel. The graphic novel is also an excellent way to teach complex concepts to higher level, level students and to introduce them to an important postmodern genre. This, the, it's important. And it is in its own right new to us. I mean, the Japanese are kill killing themselves laughing right now, but never mind. The graphic novel puts the control into the hands of a child. They can figure it out. Kai at six, had we let him, would have spent hours with that book. Totally wrong. <laughs> Bad thing. But he would have, if he could have. Um, Some of the other problems as a writer that I would have is it's very difficult to show internal emotion in a graphic novel. It's, it's almost impossible, it has been done, to do backstory in a graphic novel. It's cumbersome and it's clumsy. Um, the only one where I've sort of seen it successfully done was in uh, My Journey to Israel, uh, where this girl would go to an area and then she would tell the backstory of what happened there and it, it kind of worked. Um, but I've never seen it successfully done anywhere else. So in other words, um, what you see is what you get. And you cannot go a whole lot deeper. However, that said, the relationship between a writer and an artist, for Dan and I, it was incredibly intense, wonderful, He's, he's an amazing guy. His wife is much more amazing. She's a criminal lawyer. 
I finally have a card in my pocket that says, you know, I, I can pull it and say, ah, oh, I know a criminal lawyer, so I've got four people on my hit list that I want killed. When they say you've got one call to your lawyer, oh, I got the card, I got him. I killed him. Um, Dan and I, we talked every day for months. However, with writing this, it also came at an incredibly turbulent time in my life. And I don't think I was the partner that I, I sold a house, I bought a house, I sold a car, I bought a car. I packed up a monster house, uh, don't think it was grand, it wasn't, um, and moved it into a little doll house across the, I mean, my life was just like a bomb went off in the middle of it. Meanwhile, there's Dan sending me these things. <laughs> really, Dan? Because I got the movers in here right now. Um, to recognize his efforts, special efforts, and, and they are, he's never been to Africa. These images that you see, that they're in my head. I don't know how he got into my head, but they're my head. That's exactly how he got it. It was amazing. But I also wanted to thank him more deeply than that. And so you will see that it says Sharon Mackay and Dan LaFrance. So I share authorship with him. He's quite an amazing guy. I think if this book does what we think it's going to do, I think we'll lose him to New York. This guy's gone. He's a Quebecer. He was offered a million dollar contract. Dan's waiting. <laughs> take me with you, please. Nadia, make him take me. Um, my goal was to just have some fun. If you got anything out of it, well, good luck for you. But I'm half an hour over my allotment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, like, so it's like I got like tons here. I got like tons. Um, great stories are designed to expose young readers to different lives. That's the goal. Quote, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one life. George R. R. Martin. That's the goal. That's my goal. Um, oh, shut up, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I don't actually physically like, shut up, I will keep going. I will follow you to your cars <laughs> and say one more thing. So instead, I mean, I did invite you to ask questions all the way through. You're uh, sitting there appalled. Um, or saying, you know, like I was supposed to be home for the babysitter half an hour ago. So can I take questions that, that I don't know the answers to? Go ahead. Shoot. Oh, God, Richard, it had to be you. I did mention that he was a professor from <laughs> Memorial. I'll come back to you. Yes. The Three Stooges. Love them, yeah. Who can't? Violent. Is that, is that, um, North America trying to recover from World War II? I don't know. The Three Stooges, is that um, in terms of, of blatant entertainment, a desire of escapism? Absolutely. Um, you know, when we talked about uh, what do children want out of literature, sometimes they just want a good laugh. Mm. They want, they want Pink ponies. They we want that. Yeah, yeah. I, I frankly was not, never a big fan, but you know what? That's more of a boy thing. And no, I, I yes, see such girl boys. Like no, you love them. Hmm? No, I've never met any woman who likes the Three Stooges. I, any woman in here like the Three Stooges? I've never seen what was funny. I mean, <laughs> and the guys, well, you know, fun, I think Yeah, I've seen my sons actually think they're hilarious. No. <laughs> okay, Richard, go. Uh, you would agree that Friday the 13th without violence is not Friday the 13th. You've never seen it, of course. But, so therefore, it's necessary. So to the story. it's not gratuitous. <laughs> Anyone want to take that one on? Um, you're saying that simply it is what it is. Well, that and that. and you go in knowing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. go in knowing that this is entertainment, and this is what you're going to get. 
and and there's never a period in time when ever anybody's tried to disguise that the and all of that we all know none of I, I don't know how many have you ever watched Friday the 13th I bet you say no okay but do you know about it you know vaguely what it's I know about I don't want to go in. Okay, <laughs> see? So I must say, in this case, the producers did all that they could to pre-warn us, so you go in there knowing what you're going to get. The problem is when kids go into things and they're assaulted without knowing beforehand, or there's no help and guidance. And, and this needs guidance, unless you're of a certain age. In Korea, by the way, this is only sold as adults. Um, as we're seeing the foreign sales happen, in most countries, they're only selling it to adults. Canada right now is, it's, oh, and you know what? It's not out yet. There might be a nice little backlash here that says, no, 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 no. It's going into the adult section. Do you remember the I Ivory Bones, was it? No, Lonely Bones. What was it? Oh, yeah. Lovely, Lovely bones. bones. That was a YA. Mm -hmm. That lasted in the YA uh, area for, yeah, it was a YA. And they pulled it and repackaged it and stuck it back in the adults. And that's why. So, you know, you could watch with me. Um, the reviews are not out. The review copies aren't even out. This really is the first box out. So um, you'll watch and read with me and see if we get hammered or not. I'm in PEI. What? <laughs> just I'll just hide. Yes. I have a question of, given that you write about so many different um, cultural and about so many different cultural contexts. Do you ever get a chance that to go back to the kids or the people that you talked with and actually have them read? Oh, yeah. Made all of oh, yeah. And that's the internet, right? Yeah. You're welcome. Um, that's just a function of, yeah, that we talk all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the only one that I am uh, disappointed with is, is enemy territory because it was so, I, there were so many readers on it. There was rabbis that drove me crazy. There was Palestinians. There was, it, it felt like I was an orchestra leader. It was just overwhelming, you know. So, but yes, I mean, I, especially in Afghanistan. Um, I talk with them once a week. Um, so, yes. Any more? We're going to wrap this up. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for letting me go over half an hour more. <laughs>